Hey there, everybody. Good morning. The 17th of April here in 2021. It's 10.01 in the morning, just a touch late here today. And we're in the book of Romans, chapter number 12 today. We mentioned that the first eight verses deal with salvation and the redemption of man. And then, I'm sorry, not first eight verses, first eight chapters deal with the salvation of man, the sinfulness of man, the need for salvation, where sin came from, what the end result of sin is and so forth. Then chapters 9, 10, and 11 dealt specifically with the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, God's past dealings with them in chapter 9, his present dealings with them in chapter 10, and his future dealings in chapter number 11. So now chapter 12, we move away from that subject. And what a blessing chapter number 12 is. Let me see here. How many verses are we dealing with? Uh, 21 of them. And I'll tell you, they are some of the most jam-packed verses in all of the Bible. A lot of good, practical Christian instruction here in chapter number 12. And so this is for everybody, Jew, Gentile, all of us who are believers in Christ, regardless of our nationality or ethnicity, or whatever, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's go ahead and pray and we'll jump into chapter number 12. Heavenly Father, we love you and we ask your blessing here on our study today. Would you speak to our hearts? Would you remind us of some things that we've already learned? Would you maybe teach us some new things that we hadn't learned yet? And I pray most importantly that whatever we take away from this intellectually that we'll put into practice as we live our day today. We love you, we thank you, we ask for the mind of Christ as we read and study, and then as we go forth into the day, we ask it all in Christ's name, amen. All right, so Romans chapter number 12, verse number one. You probably have heard these verses, one and two, if not have them memorized. I beseech you therefore, brethren, so I plead with you, I'm encouraging you strongly, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. So Paul is saying we need to present our bodies a living sacrifice. So usually sacrifices are slaughtered, aren't they? If you bring a, a lamb or a goat or an ox to sacrifice to God, then you take its life. You slit the throat, you bleed it out, and you take the life of the sacrifice. Paul saying we need to be living sacrifices. So we don't take our own lives uh, to give them to the Lord, but we give our lives to the Lord. We sacrifice our lives to God. And here's the kind of sacrifice we need to be. Holy, acceptable unto God. And it says, which is your reasonable service. That means God's not asking too much of you. What, what, what's he asking? Your whole life. You say, well, that's an awful big ask, yeah, but it's not too much. It's not too much for the one who gave you your life, who sustains your life, who provides everything you need for your life, who redeemed you by the blood of his own son. It's not too much to ask that you would give him back your life in return. Verse number two, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and an acceptable and perfect will of God. And so, do you see these verses, just these verses are packed full of so much good stuff. So the first thing is don't be conformed to this world. So in what way? In any way. How does this world think? Don't think that way. How does this world behave? Don't behave that way. How does this world dress? Don't dress that way. How does this world talk? Don't talk that way. How does this world, you know, behave morally? Don't behave morally that way. You know, you should be above that. And so don't be conformed to this world. When people see you, they ought to think you're different. They ought to think there's something different about you. But what's the alternative? But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So God doesn't want us to be conformed to the world. He wants us transformed. And the way that transformation takes place is by the renewing of your mind. Instead of thinking like the world thinks and reading the world's materials and watching the world's news and, and getting the world's thoughts and opinions and understanding of things, 
transform your mind. Go to the Word of God. Hang around God's people. Spend time with God in prayer and ask Him to renew your mind. And what's this going to do? That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So there's three wills of God mentioned here. There's the good will of God. There's the acceptable will of God. And there is the perfect will of God. And so often we, we think of where we are and, and, you know, am I in God's will where I'm living right now? You know, that's the least of it, to be quite honest with you. What you do is more important than where you do it. Uh, you know, you can be geographically where you're supposed to be, but if you're not doing what you're supposed to do, the geography doesn't really matter does it? And uh, I told you these are just cursory readings. We don't have time to get into it. I could spend 30 minutes on verses 1 and 2. We should move on. Verse number 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So we're not supposed to think higher of ourselves than we actually are. That just simply means to be humble, doesn't it? You know what? Realize who you are, where you come from, acknowledge your shortfalls and your shortcomings, and don't think yourself better than other people. And it says to think soberly. That means seriously, to consider who you are and consider your standing before God. According as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So God gives us our faith. He gives every man a measure of faith, and that faith we use to place in Christ and to put in God. Verse 4, for as we, uh, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. So try not to think of this as a human body. So many times we go down that road. We talked about this when we were in the study on the local church on Wednesday nights. Think of it as a body of people, a church as a body, a governing body, for instance, like Congress as a body. Uh, you know, anytime a group of people organize for a specific purpose, the group is the body. So we have many members in one body. Like for instance, my family, uh, we are a body. We are four people that make up one family. That family is the body. So we have four members, Shannon and myself and Nicole and Winston, four members. So we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office. I have a role in our family. Shannon has a role in our family. Nicole has a role and Winston has a role and none of those roles are the same roles. Verse 5, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. And so all of these are gifts that he's saying people in the body have. And of course, he's talking about the body of the church. And so the head of the body, the church is Christ. The pastor is the under shepherd under Jesus Christ. And then we have the office of deacon. And then we've got other folks serving according to their gifts. So their gifts differ, verse number six tells us. We don't all do the same thing, and we shouldn't all be doing the same thing. We ought to be working toward our strength. So the first one listed, listed is prophecy. Verse seven, ministry, which is just serving. Uh, teaching is next in verse seven. Exhortation is encouragement. Uh, giving is another gift. Ruling is administrating and then showing mercy uh, with cheerfulness. And so whatever your gift is, you ought to be using that to serve God in your local church. Verse number nine, let love be without dissimulation. And so dissimulation is mean, means concealment. 
It means be expressive of your love. You know, if you love someone, you should tell them. Now, of course, within boundaries of appropriateness, you know, some married man shouldn't go up to another married woman and express his Christian love for her. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about just being open and clear about our love for our fellow uh, saints, for the Christians that we serve alongside and so forth. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. You want success in the Christian life? There it is, those two statements. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. So develop a hatred for evil. You know, whatever is evil, you don't want that in your life. You don't want it a part of your life. You want to, you want away from it. Cleave to that which is good. Hang closely. Spend time with. Be nearest that which is good. <clears throat> Verse number 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. So again, another verse just full of, of good stuff. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. So we ought to be kind to each other. The people that we serve with in church, if we're not careful, sometimes we'll feel too close to them. We'll feel like we can say whatever we want to say. Whatever comes to mind, we just blurt it out. We have no filter. That's wicked to behave that way. You shouldn't just say anything your flesh comes up with to say. And uh, we're to be kind. We're to use kindness in our interactions, some courtesy and so forth. Kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. And so brotherly love is a proper love. It's not a lustful love. It's not an inappropriate love. It's proper. In, uh, in honor, preferring one another. And so when, uh, this is the example I always use, maybe because it's the most that hits home for me, if there's a pizza box and there's one slice left and you and a couple other people are sharing that pizza, you know, what do you do with that last slice? Do you offer it to the others before you take it? Because if you do, that's preferring one another. But if you're gobbling down your last slice so that you can grab it, that's not preferring the other person, is it? Next, verse number 11, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So slothful means dragging your feet, taking your time, not worried about getting it done. You're on your time clock and people can adjust to you. The Bible says, don't be that way. Don't be lazy. Don't drag your feet. Get done for the Lord what you need to get done for him. Fervent in spirit. Fervency is excitement and energy. And so our spirit, pardon me, ought to be fervent when it comes to the things of the Lord. And then serving the Lord. Do something for God. Do something to live for God. Verse number 12, rejoicing in hope. So we, we get excited about that which is in front of us. Patient in tribulation. That means when we're going through tough times, we keep on going through them. We don't let it slow us down or hurt us. Continuing instant in prayer. So we're always going to the Lord and talking to him, getting his input and talking to him about our efforts. Verse 13, distributing to the necessity of the saints. When someone has a need, we step up and meet that need. Given to hospitality, we ought to be able to host people with good hospitality, meet their needs as they have them. Verse 14, bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. So people that are, that are on your case because of what you believe, bless those people. I tell you, it's not always easy to do that, is it? Sometimes we want to we want to react. We want to get revenge. Uh, we want to return uh, venom with venom, and it's not to be that way. We're to bless them which persecute us. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. You know, the thing that gets in the way of rejoicing with those who rejoice is envy. When we say, "Man, why do they get that and I don't get it?" Why, why did God bless them that way, but he's never blessed me that way? That's envy. And when you have envy, you don't rejoice. 
You know, if somebody shows up to church tomorrow with a new car or a new suit of clothes, uh, even a new Bible, and you go, man, why do they get all the nice stuff? Why, why does all the good things happen to them? Well, that's envy, and you're not rejoicing with them. If somebody rolls in in a new suit of clothes, you should say, man, good for you. I'm glad that you got to enjoy that. And you rejoice with them. Reap with them who that weep. Uh, weep with them that weep. And so we ought to be able to have compassion and empathy toward those who are hurting. Verse 16, be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. And that doesn't mean to be condescending. It means to meet them at their level. Be not wise in your own conceits. And so really there's four things there in that verse. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. And so we ought to greet each other on equal ground. Really that's what all four of those things are saying. Be of the same mind one toward another. Don't think that you're better than anybody else and don't think that you're worse than anybody else. Now someone else and their their uh, characteristics of their life or their character, they may inspire you, but don't think that that makes them better than you. Nor do you, should you think that you're better than anybody else. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. You know, just be there for the people who need you. Don't seek the attention of people that aren't willing to give it to you. I teach this to teenagers a lot, and adults need to hear it as well. But sometimes we try to win over people that wouldn't give us the time of day, but because we admire them or we like them or we want their approval, man, we'll jump through every hoop they put in front of us to get it. Meanwhile, there are people we could be helping. If we weren't chasing the attention and affections of these other people, we could help that person. Next, be not wise in your own conceits. And so uh, as you're considering yourself, your own eyes basically is what it's saying. Uh, don't, don't, you know, get proud thinking you're full of wisdom. Verse 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. So you don't return evil for evil. You just approach them with honesty and do right by them, even if they do wrong by you. That doesn't mean you have to let them run you over. It doesn't mean you have to let them take advantage of you, although you may choose to do that. But if you choose to do it, then you can't whine about it and throw it in their face later on. Verse number 18, if it be possible, I love the way this is phrased. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. So if it be possible, as much as lie within you, given everything you've got, live peaceably with all men. God's people ought to be peacemakers. We ought to seek common ground with people. We ought to seek uh, to get along with people and do right by them. Verse 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And so he's teaching people here, don't waste your time on revenge. Turn it over to God. God says he'll handle it. Don't give place to wrath. That means don't allow it in your heart. Get rid of it. Verse 20, therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. So people sometimes think that that's revenge. <laughs> Because when we think of it, heaping coals of fire on someone's head, that's going to burn them, right? It's going to hurt them. And so, but that's not what it means. It actually means to help them stay warm when they're cold. So when you give someone hungry food who's your enemy and give someone who's your enemy drink when they're thirsty, you're actually going to comfort them and help them. And that's what he's saying here. He's not saying that it's a form of twisted revenge. That's not what it is. And I've heard that taught and preached so much, and that's not right. Verse 21, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And so, boy, let's break those two phrases down before we finish up. Be not overcome of evil. You know, Brother Areza preached this week on the devil wearing out the saints in the last days, and the Antichrist wearing out the saints. What does that mean? He means tiring us out, making us exhausted. 
And so that's overcome with evil, isn't it? Man, you turn on the news and every story is negative and, and about evil and wickedness. And we get overcome with that. We just say, you know what? Let's move into the middle of nowhere where we don't have to deal with people anymore. That's being overcome of evil. What do we do instead? When we hear of evil, we combat evil with good. Someone does you wrong, do them right. Someone hurts you, you bless them. Someone criticizes you, you say good things about them. Someone steals from you, you give to them when they're in need. You overcome evil with good. And so, chapter number 12 of Romans Man, it is packed full of good, practical Christian instruction, isn't it? I hope you've enjoyed it. Again, we just scratched the surface on this stuff. You could preach a sermon on every verse or two all the way down through that chapter. All right, I'm going to leave you alone, let you get about your Saturday, as will I. Thanks for watching this morning. As always, like, love, share the post. Tomorrow morning, we'll be playing chapter number 13 recorded at 8 a.m. Those of you who like to catch it when it first shows up, of course, everybody's Lord's Day is busy, but I hope that you're making plans today to be in church tomorrow. And if you're local, you want to be at Lighthouse Baptist Church at 5458 Fenton Road. We just finished our revival and let's keep on moving. Let's take that momentum and energy and keep going forward with it. Amen. All right. God bless you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.